when we have the judgments in Revelation mapped out in the proper order, because for the first time we've put them specifically in the right order. We know exactly which one happens before the next one. So it'll be like seal, trumpet, vial, seal, vial, trumpet. Okay, in the exact order we got this directly from scripture. This is going to provide people with the play-by-play -play of which specific judgment happens after the one previous to it. So that if you see something happen, you know what comes next if you're in the tribulation period. Very important. Also that there will be a pre-trib rapture and we're going to prove that further today. All right, today we're going to do something very important, and that is line up Joel chapter 1 with the rest of our end times doctrinal understanding. Remember, folks, progressive revelation is a core tenet of how we understand the scriptures, and there is ample evidence of why we have to understand scripture through the lens of progressive revelation. That means what? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost when they were writing the scriptures down. However, they did not have a complete understanding of scripture when they were writing it down. Daniel chapter 12 proves this. He says, I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And God says to him, oh, I'll explain it to you right now, Daniel, so you can understand this prophecy that you're relaying through what becomes scripture, right? No. He says, the words that I'm giving you, the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Specifically, the context there, I understood not. So, what will be unsealed? God is answering his specific question. The understanding of these things. Words of God. There's ample evidence. I can give you many other examples. When scripture is given, the people do not understand all of it right away. In fact, I'll give you just one more. The apostles. When the apostles were watching Jesus fulfill prophecy in his first coming, they actually did not understand what he was doing a lot of the time. It says, these things understood we not at the first until after Jesus was glorified. Essentially what happens in Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down and the Holy Spirit is the teacher. So now they go back into the Old Testament and they say, I didn't know, but that was actually a prophecy that Jesus fulfilled right before our faces in his first coming. Now we're going to take a look at one of these later on and you're going to be amazed because it's true that there's no way you would have seen that in Old Testament times. I will show you guys this. Okay, but for now, Joel chapter 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel. So we're reading here literally these are the words of God. And Joel is what? He's part of a collection of books in the Bible that we call what? The prophets, the major and minor prophets. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? The implication obviously being no. So this is a prophecy for how far out there in the future? What does it say right here? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. So God is saying this prophecy is going to be way out there into the future. Now, this was not fulfilled in the past because nothing this terrible ever happened to Israel. Especially when you get to Joel chapter 3, that is exceedingly difficult to take a preterist interpretation of how Joel chapter 3 wraps up. And then we're going to go further into Joel chapter 2 today to prove definitively, even further, why no? We're not supposed to take some kind of preterist interpretation. This was not fulfilled in the past. This is a prophecy for the coming tribulation period. Align the planets, I say. Align the planets of the completed dispensationalism. Have you ever wondered when all the planets in the solar system will align? The clock is ticking, so stay. All you have to do is play. scroll down here okay let's take a look here at how joel chapter one wraps up first of all okay this is complete dispensationalism nobody has seen this specific aspect yet it says here alas for the day for the day of the lord is at hand and as a destruction from the almighty shall it come in fact we see it arrive in the next chapter that means whatever happens here folks happens before that 24-hour day of the Lord arrives. Now remember, there's a threefold meaning in Scripture for the day of the Lord in the end times. You got the millennial kingdom, you got the 24-hour day that comes at the end of the seven years that goes into the millennial kingdom, and then, generally speaking, 
when we have the judgments in Revelation mapped out in the proper order, because complete dispensationalism, we've done it for the first time. We've put them specifically in the right order. We know exactly which one happens before the next one. So it'll be like seal, trumpet, vial, seal, seal, vial, trumpet. Okay, yes, we have them in the exact order. We got this directly from scripture. You can check out our video on this after this if you want to. It's called the 10 judgments of Revelation map of the end. That is because, now we didn't know this, but when you overlay the 21 judgments in Revelation, seven times three, remember our God is three in one. But ironically, when you take the 21 judgments in Revelation and you overlay them properly according to how the scriptures tell us to, right? Such as what we're gonna find here. I'm gonna show you guys one aspect of how we found this. And it's from Joel chapter one. This is being unsealed, unlocked for the first time in the history of the church. Also, it is a typology of the 10 judgments that happened on Egypt. Once again, we didn't know this at the first until complete dispensationalism. So, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come, meaning it's not there yet, and yet they are in what we call the Great Tribulation period here, or the time of Jacob's trouble, alas for the day. Jeremiah, alas for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. All right, now, Many people also try to take a preterist interpretation of the time of Jacob's trouble, which is silly. Okay, we have so much information from Jeremiah 30 and 31 that proves that this lines up with the Great Tribulation period to include this very statement right here. Why? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. What does it say in Matthew 24? For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, no, nor ever shall be. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. The same statement in the same order, right? Now, I've read preterism, okay? I've read stuff by guys like Gary DeMar, who tries to say that there's other statements somewhere else in scripture that seem to say something similar, but it wasn't the worst time ever, so therefore God is being hyperbolic. I'm sorry to say this, that guy's lying. I took a look at his references. I read those passages. They do not make the same statement as this. So yes, we must believe God when he makes a statement like this. Let's go back over here to Joel chapter 1. Now, alas for the day. This day is actually the great tribulation, and they're waiting for another day, which is the 24-hour day of the Lord to arrive. Remember, there's a threefold understanding of the day of the Lord. Millennial day of Christ, we got... The 24-hour day of Christ that goes directly into the Millennial Kingdom. And we got the entire 70th week as a symbolic day of the Lord. And that is understood because the judgments are like the sun is rising and there's a judgment of darkness afterwards. Then we come at the end and we break the darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. When we map out the judgments, it goes like this. You literally see a symbolic day progressing in the judgments themselves. But you have to understand the 10 judgments of Revelation. Once again, watch our video. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. It's not there yet. It arrives in the very next chapter. Now we're at the end of Joel chapter 1 here. So, they're already in this day, though, and then they're waiting for another day to come. So, alas for the day, is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Now, up here, it's already talking about that before it even makes this statement where the day of the Lord is not there yet. So, they're already in this time where there's what? Famine. Now, this is due to multiple reasons, not only due to the third seal and the fourth seal. Let's take a look here. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed, because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures, plural, of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Now, folks, let me show you something. First, let's line this up. Here we go. These are the seven angels, which are given seven trumpets in Daniel's 70th week at the time of the end. This is from the book of Revelation, right? What does it say here? It says, the first angel sounded. This is the first trumpet. The third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Now, folks, we clearly see that this has already taken place before the 24-hour day of the Lord has arrived with the signs of the sixth seal. That means that trumpets have already occurred before the sixth seal. Let me repeat that again. Let's slow down here so people get this, right? Trumpets have already occurred before the sixth seal. So 
Many people interpret the seals to happen before the trumpets all together, and then the trumpets happen before the vials or the bowls all together. It's a perfectly sequential order. No, when you're reading the book of Revelation, remember, he took John up in the spirit. So he's in the third heaven, and we've proven this in one of our videos due to how the cherubim are actually presenting themselves in a spatial dimensional way. This actually ties you back into the book of Ezekiel and like the UFO that they saw and everything. It's pretty crazy stuff. I'm not lying to you. What do we say? Okay, we say that this here, this channel, we have the soundest doctrine on the net. You say, why is your channel so small? It's not that small, okay? Facebook has 7,700 subscribers right now. This channel just recently hit 777 subscribers, kind of an interesting number for this point in time, right? But folks, how many people listened to Noah when Noah was preaching the first time? Remember, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. So what does it say here, folks? It says that they have no pasture. The fire hath devoured the pastures, plural of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. God repeated himself three times down here. He says, for the fire and the flame and the fire, right? Just to let you know, threefold, that these judgments on the grass and the trees, also the famine is being spoken about up here. Okay, so now what about vials or bowls? Are there any vials that happen before the sixth seal, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. Now, did we see anything here about a river being dried up? Well, it says here, for the rivers of water are dried up. So we can see here that definitely we have the trumpet judgments happening before the signs of the sixth seal, but also there's a strong possibility that the vials also happen too, and they do when we overlap them properly. But let's go back up here and this makes sense as to why the meat is cut off. What does it say here? How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because, because they have no pasture because the fire burned everything up. So we can see here that the judgments work in conjunction together. They actually will line up in 10 perfect categories. Okay, you can find this in our video that I talked about earlier, right? The 10 judgments of Revelation map of the end. They line up in 10 perfect categories we see here that when you see something about famine, that's not just due to like a seal alone. A first trumpet actually contributing to that same judgment. They're happening at the same time. They'll be overlapping. So why is there famine? That's because of the first trumpet, as you can see here. Famine, the food is cut off because fire had burned up all this stuff. Now it makes sense. Now, up here, just to scroll on up here, let me explain something. This is also part of the famine. Howl all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. This is actually due to locusts. Now, this is not the same army in Joel chapter 2 up at the top. Okay, it mentions it later on, but what does it say? It says that the years of the locusts God will restore. So, the army coming down at the top of Joel chapter 2 comes down in less than a 24-hour period, and they're just ripping through the land. They're coming in like a thief which is the same way that God comes to Armageddon like a thief to those who don't know scripture about the 1260-day prophecy. Remember, God is going to shorten each individual day because God is not a liar. And there's multiple, multiple places where we have the 1260-day prophecy, the 42-month prophecy, the three-and-a-half-year prophecy. Those are all specific time periods. God gave you a threefold way to overlay them. Those are talking about the same time period. So at the end of those days, 1260, the second coming of Christ happens, Right. So when it says God has to shorten the days, yes, each individual day will be shortened. How do we understand this? Well, you got to look at the 10 judgments of Revelation and it makes perfect sense because towards the end, there's going to be darkness. Okay, the sun, there's a judgment on the sun too and how it gives its light. And then Jesus is the sun. He arrives as the morning with us, the body of Christ up there on the mountains and we break the darkness. Yes, indeed. All right. So this right here, we can see that there's already famine and it reiterates that down there and explains how the fires have burned up all the pastures and the trees. That's the first trumpet. But we understand that this is not due to just the third seal. Okay, the third seal is famine, right? But what is it saying now? And it says, hurt not the oil and the wine. So how does the oil and the wine get hurt, you say, James? Well, because of this. This is why we have to overlap these things, folks. These are the two witnesses. They're prophesying how long? 1,203 score days, 1,260 days, just one of many. Now, do they show up in the first half or the second half? It actually doesn't matter. Okay, the symbolic aspect of what they're doing, we're going to read in a second, is what matters. Okay, there's a symbolic meaning to what they're literally doing. Now, 
they can show up in the second half. That would simply mean that you take the 1260 days and you move them to the left a little bit on the time frame because there's a three day period of time, three and a half days where they're going to be dead and then God is going to resurrect them and then his second coming will happen. Okay, so you move it to the left a little bit. Now, why do we do this, James? Are you just shoving things into place for your own doctrine? No, actually, at the time of the early church, they did this with three different timelines within Daniel's 70th week. They took, what, the 1260 days, the 1290 days, and the 1335 days, and they will have them all end on the same day, meaning they're going to start kind of staggered, but they'll all end on the same day. So they'll shift them to the left if you understand my meaning. Don't get too confused about what I'm saying right now. It's not that important, okay? Now, we don't have to interpret those days like that because those days can be that after Jesus comes, there's like a period of time and then the millennial temple is set up and that's what is fulfilled in like maybe the 1335 days. We're not gonna get into this right now because honestly, that doesn't matter as much. Let's scroll down here though. What does it say right here? These two witnesses, whether they show up in the first half or the second half or somewhere even in the middle, it doesn't matter. It's just God is using another example that three and a half is important right? Three and a half years. Remember, how long are they dead? Three and a half days. Okay. So now let's scroll down here. These have power to shut heaven. These are the two witnesses that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. If you want to have a total understanding of this, you need to look at three places, folks. I'll give them to you right now. Joel chapter two, Hosea chapter six, James chapter five. Yes. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. What does James five say? That Elijah in the past, stopped the rain for three and a half years. That's why James 5 is talking about that, because we all believe that Elijah is one of the two witnesses, either literally Elijah or somebody coming in the spirit of Elijah, right? Now, three and a half years again, what do they have power to do? Shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. But watch this. Also, they have power over waters to turn them to blood. Who did that in the past? So we got the first one. Who did that one in the past? Three and a half years, literally, Elijah stopped the rain from heaven. Everybody believes Elijah is one of the two witnesses. That's why you got to take a second look at James chapter five. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. That's Moses. He did that in the past. So they're going to be doing it again. They're showing up. They're showing up again and they're doing the judgments. But watch what it says here. It says they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So, folks, that's why in Joel chapter 1, what was another one of the plagues besides just turning the water to blood that Moses had the capability of doing? It's the locusts that covered Egypt. So, right here, and this is going to happen over a period of years, the two witnesses are there for three and a half years, it's the locusts, these are what is going to cut off the wine. So that cannot be just due to the seal, like the third seal, folks. Okay, you see this? Because the third seal says, touch not the oil and the wine. So this is also, you got to overlap, not just the seals, trumpets, vials. You have to pay attention to what the two witnesses are doing. In addition to the seals, okay, this is not just due to the seals alone. Also, check it out. This is why we have to rightly divide the word of truth. God puts differences in there. Why? There is another judgment, the opening of the bottomless pit, and then smoke comes out, and that's actually what darkens the sky after the judgment of the hot sun. So this is like the symbolic day over the 70th week when you overlap the judgments. We have this totally mapped out, folks. All right, you map out the day like this. In the middle, you got a harsh sun. Okay, that's like symbolic 3 p.m. or something on the day, right? Then you have the darkness, the judgment of darkness. They open up the bottomless pit. That has to happen before the fourth seal, believe it or not. Did you know that? Because why? Death and hell following him. So the bottomless pit has to be open so that hell is literally going to follow. They're going to kill about a fourth of the earth. They have power to kill, let me specify. It doesn't mean, you see, you got to take the Bible word for word. Every word of God is pure. We can't assume anything beyond what scripture tells us. We're not adding anything or subtracting anything from the words of God especially not the book of Revelation. That's why we don't jump to concluding. We don't jump all the way to concluding a faith plus works of the law of salvation in the book of Revelation. If you want to watch our documentary on that, salvation in the tribulation. That's why we are right on that particular aspect. Ruckman was right about a lot of things, but not that. And not a couple other little small things, but not that big one. Okay? Very important to watch what's going on with complete dispensationalism right now, folks. Who's paying attention? As in the days of Noah, how many people did Noah reach? I wonder. I'm not saying I'm Noah. Okay? Relax, folks. It's just typology type of stuff. Okay, now, so what happens when they open the bottomless pit? Smoke comes out of the pit, it darkens the sky, and out of the smoke flies a specific new kind of locusts. And these have tails like a scorpion, but what are they told to do? They are told, they are instructed not to hurt any green thing. This is actually after the judgment of hot sun, now darkness comes. Symbolic evening into night at the end, 
Jesus breaks the darkness as the new morning. Okay, this is the 24-hour day, and then we go into the millennial day of Christ. We got it, folks. Complete dispensationalism. But with their scorpion tails, they're stinging people. However, they're commanded not to kill them. Okay? In those days, people shall seek death, but not find him. And then death will arrive. That's the fourth seal. So this happens way later on. The fourth seal, you got to overlap them, right? The fourth seal happens way later on because now... Now here comes death. They were looking for it. Now they're going to get it, right? Death and hell follows him, meaning the bottomless pit had to be open. Now hell is literally following him. Now this is towards really the end of the seven years. And that's because another reason, folks, you can see the severity of the judgments increasing. Just like they did in the 10 judgments on Egypt, God did not just kill the firstborn right away. He kept warning Pharaoh over and over and over and over again. And that is a just judgment if you're a holy and righteous God. Why? Pharaoh was killing all the babies of Israel, right? Okay, now let's take a look here at Joel chapter 2, and what does it say up here at the top? For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. See, it's still not there yet. But they're looking for what? The day of the Lord, and that arrives with the signs of the sixth seal. Now, here we're breaking the darkness as the morning, a day of darkness and of gloominess, because that's how it's going to look due to the ten judgments of Revelation that we've mapped out. As a morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong, there had not been ever the like. There hath not been ever the like. This is not talking about the locusts. This is talking about a people that will fall upon the sword and not be wounded. That's a very odd blowing a trumpet because you're going to war with locusts. That's very silly. Okay. A fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth. Horses of fire, right? The body of Christ is coming. Now we're riding on these horses of fire. This cannot be even the other locust army in Revelation because they're commanded not to touch any green thing. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen. Those are the riders. Guess what? You know what the new versions did? They removed the horsemen. This is in the Hebrew, folks. And we have lined this up with other passages to prove that that's literally talking about literal human riders on horses. Okay, they have ranks. That's because we're going to receive rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, you see. So now we're coming down to deliver Israel. Right? Israel is essentially the land. A lot of the land of Israel has been invaded and taken over at this time. The Jews are on the run. They're getting hunted and killed. The Antichrist beast system is all over the world. But there's been a judgment of what? Darkness on the kingdom of the Antichrist. That's why we're breaking the darkness as the morning. Now here's the signs of the sixth seal. Now remember, I've shown you guys multiple places in scripture and immediately after the signs of the sixth seal, God is coming down with his sword to the wine press. Okay, it's not like the signs of the sixth seal happen and there's a couple years of God just kind of staying up there in heaven and just kind of casting judgments down on the earth. No, no, no. Joel chapter 2 here, Joel chapter 3. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. That's us. We're coming down with God. Isaiah 34. God is going to bring his sword down to the wine press. Okay, so in all of these places, we see the signs of the sixth seal and then it says things like for or and. The Lord also is what it says in Joel chapter 3. It says the Lord also. So in addition to these signs of the sixth seal happen, the Lord's coming down. So this is not a pre-wrath rapture, folks. This is the end of the seven years because he's coming down with us and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great for he is strong that executeth his word for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible and who can abide it? Now the day of the Lord has arrived. Okay, we're going to enter in the windows like a thief. We're coming down quickly. We're burning through the land. Also, if we go down here, what do we see? We see... The former rain and the latter rain. This is the early and latter rain. You can find this in the book of James chapter 5 as well. Okay, I've talked about this at length, folks. There's a symbolic understanding. It's a threefold understanding, once again, of the rain, the grass, and the sun. Now, we know what the sun and the grass are definitively. Now we've unlocked what the rain symbolically represents. Although there's probably going to be literal rain, it will symbolically represent something just like the other two. Now, why do we have to use a consistent hermeneutic to interpret it like that? Because these three things are interacting together. So if two of them are symbolic, God's the sun, he's coming down, he's burning up the grass, those are the people, what's the rain represent? That's their eternal life, okay? The water, remember, you drink into, they drink into one spirit, right? Remember, that's why complete dispensationalism is correct in addition to many other reasons that they are not new creatures in Christ because that's been raptured out. Now, they're in this time period, they have to wait. They're the fruit of the earth, the body of Christ is a heavenly people, right? They're the fruit of the earth. They're waiting, like James chapter 5 says, for the early and latter rain. Why? Well, what does it give reference there to is that Elijah stopped the rain from heaven, but he prayed again and gave forth its rain. So that's why there's a possibility that after the three and a half days of the two witnesses dying, right? God's going to resurrect them and he prayed again and brought forth its rain. It's very possible that at this point in time is the second coming of Christ on day 1260. 
And now the rain comes in. That's why he has to bring them both in the first month, in the same month. Okay, this is the first month of, as we go into, I believe, the Millennial Kingdom. But why do the early and latter rain fall in the same month? Because they typically fall six months apart from each other. Because there's been a drought on the earth. It hasn't been raining for a specific period of time. Now, whether you want to say that that's all symbolic or all literal, it doesn't matter because it represents the same thing. See that? So, what does it say in Hosea 6? Okay, here's the early and latter rain again. What does it say here, folks? It says, Come and let us return unto the Lord. This is talking to Israel. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. This is talking about how Israel's finally being brought back after 2,000 years. As it says right here, after two days. Remember, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Yes, after two days will he revive us in the third day. So we have a third day, because many people try to say, well, the number two in the Bible can just mean a few. Yeah, but you got the number three here too, because he doesn't say after two days, just after that, he's going to revive them or something. After a few days, now they're back or something. Nope. After two days, you have a three here too. After two days, will he revive us? And in the third day, this is the millennial day of Christ, the millennial kingdom. He will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. You can also line this up with other passages. They're going to literally spring out of the earth like the grass after rain is what it says by clear shining after rain. Second Samuel. Okay. So that's because if they're the grass, they got to drink the rain. They got to drink the water into eternal life. Now, all those under the age of accountability that enter the millennial kingdom, the children, they're going to grow up and have kids. It's going to be different. That's because at the end, there's going to be a rebellion. But what does it say here? Then at that time, shall we know after the 2000 years, where do we start the clock in the 2000 years? Nobody knows for sure. That's why no man knows the day or the hour of the rapture. So when are the 2000 years up? There's multiple possibilities. Okay. So when the millennial kingdom comes in, can start anywhere from the year 2030, because Jesus died on the cross in between 30 and 33 AD, depending on how you interpret it. So it can start... 2030 all the way up until 2070 that's taking it after the fall of the temple at jerusalem in 70 AD until when the millennial temple is set up right so that would be 70 AD, and the rapture might happen anytime from 2023 until like the early or mid 2060s however even then now this is a slim chance but even if the rapture does not happen by the early 2060s there's a slim chance possibility that it could still happen sometime in the 2100s. And that is because there were still factions of Israel rebelling into the 100 ADs, right? But I would say that that's kind of a stretch. Doesn't mean it can't happen. Doesn't mean God can't do it that way, but that's kind of a stretch. So we are in the time of the end and the real window of the rapture due to progressive revelation. We have a better understanding of this now, right? It is truly imminent, I should say, as of 2023, Okay, we're in the first year. This is like huge. This is massive. Okay, because this is not some Mayan prophecy that was believed by like, you know, it was just believed by the Mayans or something. This is talking about the largest belief system in the world, Christianity. You say, well, it's a, it's religion. No, even your atheism is a smaller percentage. Atheism is like seven to 10% of the world's belief system. Christianity is like 31%. Now it's shrunk since that statistic came out, but it doesn't matter. It's still among the largest belief systems in the world. That means this is much bigger than the Mayans. People should be really taking this seriously. It's time to see if this Bible is actually going to come true or not, right? So then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth. See, this is the same thing that happens in Joel chapter three. His going forth is prepared as the morning. He's going to come down there. He shall roar out of Zion. He's bringing his sword down to the wine press. He shall what? Come unto us. He's coming down, right? He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. He's going to bring in the rain. And then he's going to dwell there and no strangers will pass through Jerusalem anymore forever, right? So we see also here that the early and latter rain, that's the same thing that we saw in Joel chapter 2. Further fortifying our understanding that we are lining these things up properly, right? So what does it say here now? Let's take a look. I'm going to wrap this up right here. So this is very common. In scripture, why do we have to interpret prophecy literally? That is because God will literally have prophecies about the first coming of Jesus and the second coming, but they'll be found back to back, sometimes in the same paragraph or even the same sentence in the Old Testament. So if Jesus fulfilled the first coming prophecies literally, 
He comes in on a donkey, right? There's actually a donkey and a colt because it represents that there's going to be two comings. The second time he's coming down literally on his horse to battle. The first time he's coming in on his donkey, it prophesied that all the way back to the first book of the Bible, which is the book of Genesis in chapter 49. Guess what it also has in chapter 49 in Genesis, folks? The law of first mention of the last days. And he's prophesying a prophecy central to Israel. That's why in Acts chapter 3, for example, Peter doesn't know about all the mysteries of the church age body of Christ doctrines yet. He doesn't even know what the body of Christ is, this heavenly entity in Christ. He doesn't know that because that's a mystery. Paul says that a mystery is that we are in Christ. That's actually a mystery. You can go check it out. So Peter did not know those things way back in Acts chapter 3. What Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, that's his most up-to-date understanding, which is 70th week expectation. So he just saw Jesus go up and he's thinking he's going to come back really soon. I got to prepare Israel, right? We're going to go through the 70th week. He was just talking about this. That's why he's expecting like the signs of the sixth seal and then God's going to come and Romans 11 reiterates this, turn away ungodliness from Jacob, right? That's not what happened back then, even though Peter was expecting that. So the apostles are not infallible. They're sinners like the rest of us, folks. The Bible is what's infallible. And the Bible is simply recording what the apostles were doing. That doesn't mean that everything they were doing was perfectly right on schedule and all this stuff. No, God had to correct Peter with the vision, right? Peter did not even remember what Jesus said about water baptism in Acts chapter 1 all the way until Acts chapter 11. That's why, as we know, many people go to Acts chapter 2 and they see Peter water baptizing people before they receive the Holy Spirit. And then people have carried forward that doctrine as if Peter knew what he was doing back there where he was not listening to Jesus yet, right? You see this? Peter made lots of mistakes, folks. Peter denied Christ three times. Peter tried to stop the gospel of the grace of God from happening because he said, be it far from thee, Lord. And Jesus turned to him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. In that moment, he was the adversary, and you, some people say he was possessed by Satan for a moment. We don't know for 100% sure, because they didn't have the Holy Spirit poured out and sealing them yet at that point in time back then, right? See this? Got to be dispensational. You have to understand, there's different things happening at different points in Scripture. So you guys get their doctrines all messed up, folks. That's why you guys are here for complete dispensationalism, right? Okay, so what is happening here? What is happening here, folks? This is Matthew chapter 2. So they're taking baby Jesus out of Egypt that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Now let's take a look. I'm going to show you guys why this is not understood as soon as it's written down to include the New Testament. I mean, the New Testament church did not understand all the doctrines just because it was written down. We do today, right? Hosea chapter 11. This right here is the passage that Matthew was quoting from when he said, now when Jesus is coming, now it's fulfilled, way out there in the future. But back here in Hosea chapter 11, if you're just reading this and Jesus had not come yet, what are you going to think? Because what does it say? When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam or Baalim, right? And burned incest to graven images. So you're going to think this is talking about just Israel the whole time. Right When Israel was a child, I mean, there it is, it's Israel. Then I loved him, Israel, and called my son, probably talking about Israel, out of Egypt. Right, And they, I mean, look, it's still talking about Israel. They, they sacrificed unto Baalim. Now, if you want to say that this is all talking about Jesus, then you have to say that Jesus sacrificed unto Baalim, which is heresy, which is why you have to rightly divide in, even in the middle of one sentence. Check it out. When Israel was a child, then I loved him. Now, rightly divide this part way out there into the future when Jesus shows up and called my son out of Egypt. Matthew said that is to be rightly divided. So Matthew was a dispensationalist. He rightly divided this into the future. That's for Jesus Christ. Now it goes backwards again and starts talking about Israel because they're the ones who sacrificed unto Balaam. They made this mistake. Jesus didn't make that mistake. So you got to rightly divide even in one sentence. Jesus also took up Isaiah 61 and he split it in half. He was demonstrating you have to be dispensational, okay? But what about the rest of it? That comes in the future. But Jesus divided it in the middle of a sentence before it said the word and. So you have to rightly divide, orthodomanta, the word of truth. So this is also why, once again, let me finish on this note. This is very important. This is why amillennialists, replacement theologians, Catholic Church, etc. are totally incorrect. Remember, their amillennial doctrine is new. They keep calling themselves the one true church, the original church. No, they're not. Factually, historically, factually speaking, no, they're not. 
That is because they changed their doctrines away from the original church around the 400 ADs when Augustine systematized, because it didn't have a systematic theological understanding yet, amillennialism. Okay? First, there were anti-millenarians or anti-premillennialists before amillennialism even existed and then it needed a system. So in 400 AD, Augustine systematized it. This is like Hundreds of years after the start of the church, the Catholic Church went with Augustine's interpretations, which are all whacked out, dude. Totally messed up, guys. You put this guy on a pedestal, he was way wrong, right? The early church had it right. They were premillennial. You read Irenaeus. Irenaeus, ironically, is like venerated in the Catholic Church. It's very strange, right? It's like, why don't you guys listen to him? You went with Augustine, who changed away from what Irenaeus believed. What are you guys doing? This is a huge change. Prophecy makes up 28, 30% of the Bible. How do we know that we are correct about interpreting prophecy literally? That is because the way that God laid out prophecy in the Bible is that sometimes even in the same sentence, such as in Genesis 49, you can take a look at this. You got to line it up across scripture though. In Genesis 49, when it talks about the prophecy of the donkey, before the sentence is even done, it goes into talking about the prophecy of the wine press, which we know that you have to rightly divide the first coming from the second coming. So question As we know, in Jesus' first coming, how was prophecy fulfilled? Was it all figurative or was it fulfilled literally? Oh, he's riding on a donkey. It just represents that he's going to show up in this figurative, it's a symbolic way that he's coming in humble like this or something. No, he did come in humbly, but he literally got a literal donkey and he literally rode in on it. In addition to the other 300 plus prophecies that were fulfilled literally in scripture, in the first coming of Jesus Christ, in addition to other prophecies that were fulfilled literally, like Alexander the Great, he threw the stones and created a causeway, a bridge to go and conquer. This was already predicted literally in scripture, right? Now, folks, if you have a prophecy about the first coming and it's part of the same sentence or the same paragraph, but even the same sentence once again, and the sentence is not done yet, if we use a consistent hermeneutic, How do you think the second half of that sentence is going to be fulfilled? That's correct, folks. Literally.